Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many they be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. God is good. And all the time. One more time. God is good. And all the time. Mukama Mulunji. Enakuzona. Sabiti Sabiti Inunji. Abantu Bange. It's nice to see you. Thank you for loving God. Thank you for loving his house, which I hope you'll complete very soon. Thank you for loving his word. Thank you for loving good singing that the devil doesn't like. I sat and I listened. Where's the maestro? Did he go home? There he is. Thank you very much. God bless you. To sing like that, you have to be disciplined. Most churches don't like discipline. Members want to do whatever they like. You know, I watch flight attendants on airplanes and they're all dressed the same way. You go to a restaurant, the waitresses and waiters are dressed the same way. You look at the army, they're dressed the same way. You go dressed the same way. You come to church and people want to do whatever they like. The only place where discipline is not appreciated is the church. But I thank God for you and how lovely you look and even your lovelier voices. May the Lord always sing through you Amen. that those who listen may be lifted up and for the time of your singing may forget their cares and their stresses. It is 12.30 and I want to run along because we have a long day, but I cannot overlook the most important people among us and those are our visitors. If you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, I'd like you to stand. Just, ah, good. Stay standing, please. Stay standing, stay standing, all right. Okay, we have quite a few guests. Let's find out the lady's name. Good morning. Ah, that microphone is, ah, there we are. Good morning, Oh, we have church. two, good. What's your name? I'm coming, Sandra Abigail. Sandra? Abigail. Abigail, how are you, Sandra? I'm all right. Thank nice you. to see you. Where are you from? I'm from St. Francis Chapel, Makere. Is that a place? In Kampala. Oh, a church. Oh, good. Now, where do you live? I beg your pardon. Where, do you, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Makere. Makere, all right. Sandra, who invited you today? Mm, she's my friend. She's Ellen. She's in here. She's, where's, where's Sandra's friend? Are you around? Are any, ah, there she is. Thank you very much, my lovely sister. God bless you. We're delighted amen. you've come. Say amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated, my dear sister. Yes, good morning. She prefers the local language. That's fine, that's fine. You translate for me. Tell her I said hi. <laughs> she says praise the Lord. Yes, ask her her name. Unique Nyanjura. Unique Nyanjura. Unique. Unique. Ah, God bless Unique. <laughs> Ask her where she's from. She's coming from Chigumba in Bunyoro district. Kampala? No. No, Outside okay, Kampala. all right. And who invited her? The wife of the son. 
the wife of her son. Uh, we'll tell her. Daughter-in-law. Oh, daughter-in-law, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the wife of her son. All right. Tell her we're very happy she's come. She's also very happy to watch. And tell her God church. bless her. Amen. All right. Yes, my good brother. What's your name? Good morning. I'm Terry Robbins. I'm from the United States. Terry Robbins, what state? Indiana. Indiana. What city? Uh, Seymour. All right. That must be a little town. It's a little town. All right. Who invited you? Uh, Lucy and Esther, my friends from last year. At Where are they? Ah, oh, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. God bless you. God bless Indiana. God bless the United States. God bless Donald Trump. All right. Okay. Well, he's my president. God bless him. All right. Okay. What's your name? I'm called Aaron. Aaron. Yes. Hello, Aaron. Hello. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Where are you from? Kampala. Kampala. That's yes. a good place. And who invited you, Aaron? Geoffrey. Your girlfriend? Oh. What did he say? <laughs> Geoffrey. Oh, Geoffrey. Yeah. I thought he said your girlfriend. All right. Geoffrey. God bless you, Geoffrey. Aaron, good to see you. Thank you. God bless you. Say amen. amen. All right. We have back here two daughters of God. Good morning. Morning. Sir. How are you? I'm fine. What's your name? My name is Dante Violet. Your name is Violet. Hello, Violet. Hello. Where are you from? I'm Chanja. Chanja? Mm, Where's Kampala. that? Kampala, all right. And Violet, who invited you? Um, it's Aunt Joyce. Joyce? She's here. She's here. Mm. Sister Joyce, uh, God bless you, Joyce. Violet, I'm glad to see you. Amen. Are you glad to see me? Yes, I'm oh, so God, glad God. To see <laughs> God bless you, my lovely sister, right behind. Hello. Hello, how are you? What do you say? Did you say, how are you? Go, oh, good, good. Your mic seems to have gone dead. What's your name, my sister? Monica James. Your name is what? Monica James. Monica James. How are you, Monica? I'm good. Where are you from? South Sudan. South Sudan. Yeah. That's not in Kampala. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. How are things in South Sudan, okay? Not too bad. Is Juba in South Sudan? All right. Well, I hope to visit South Sudan someday if God arranges it. It's very nice to see you. God bless you. God bless your family. Say amen. amen. All right. God bless South Sudan. Is Silver Keir still the president? Yes. He is. All right. God. Always wears a big hat. Okay. Uh, who's next? Yes, my dear sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. What's your name? Faith Omogish. Faith Omogish. Okay, Faith is good enough. Nice to see you. <laughs> Nice. Faith, oh, oh, nice to see me. Come on, tell me. I'm happy to see you. Oh, good, good, good. God is good. Where are you from? I'm from Kampala. Kampala. Now tell us, Faith, who invited you? Marvin. Who? Marvin. Marvin. Yes. Who is Marvin? Oh, Marvin, there you are. <laughs> All right, Marvin, thanks a lot. Sister Faith, I am happy to see you. I'm um, too. God I'm bless happy you. Also. Thank and you. And come and see us again. Amen. Say amen. amen. All right, Sister Faith, brought to us by Brother Marvin. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm okay. You look like a nice person. <laughs> I'm humbled. You are humble. All right. What's your name? I'm Rachel. Rachel is a good name. Where are you from, Sister Rachel? I'm from around here. Yeah. You're from around? Yeah. Okay, that's in Kampala. <laughs> All right. Around is in Kampala. Now, who invited you, Rachel? Um, my neighbor. Your neighbor? Yeah. Where's your neighbor? Brother neighbor, sister neighbor, where are you? <laughs> Where is the neighbor who invited I didn't Rachel? Know. Where? Oh, oh, God bless you, sister neighbor. God bless you. Rachel, God bless you. Is something wrong with your voice? Uh, I have sinuses. So. You have sore throat? Sinus. Let's pray. Yeah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Rachel is not feeling well. She has a problem with her sinus. You're a God of love. You don't like suffering. In the name of Jesus Christ, touch her voice right now, her sinus, whatever the problem is. Remove it and give her relief. I offer this prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Let God's believing people say, Amen and Amen. Rachel, God bless your life. Bless you too. You're very welcome. Thank you. In the back. Get a microphone to God's daughter standing patiently back there. 
Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. What's your name? I'm Sandra. Sandra? Yes. Where are you from, Sandra? I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. Nairobi. Ah, karibu sana dada yangu mdogo. Mungu wa kubariki sana. Now, who invited you, Sandra? I was connected through by my husband, who is a deacon back in Kenya, to Anne and to Isenge. They are both here. Now, your husband is a deacon where? In Kenya. In what yes. church? Uh, Lovington. SDA oh, I go to Lovington all the time. Yes. What's his name? Dennis Milania. Dennis? Milania. Milania. Yes. I must look after him when I get back to Kenya. I'm going back to Kenya tonight. Uh, my yes. lovely sister, God bless you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, for sir. coming. Thank and God you. bless your family. Say amen. 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 Say it again. Amen. I see a daughter of God right back here. Let's find out what our sister's name is. Good morning. Good morning, man How? of God. Your name is what? I'm called Lois. Lois? Yes. Hello, Lois. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm very well. I'm delighted to see you. Where are you from? Me too. I'm from Kampala. You from Kampala? Yes. And who invited you, Lois? My best friend, Nina. Nina? Yeah. Ah, Nina's my sister. And nice to see Nina. <laughs> Lois, the Lord bless you, Lois. Amen. Stay close bless to Nina. Because Nina is on her way to the kingdom. You stay close to her. That's exactly where you'll go. God, say amen for Lois. Say, bless. say it again. Amen. Uh, that was weak. Say amen. amen. Uh, anybody else? Any visitors in the choir? No? All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you never know. Okay. Have we exhausted all our guests? Okay. Our subject for this morning, doing things God's way. What did I say? All right. What is this? What is that? How many of you have both? You have both. I know you all have this. I'm not sure you all have this. So how many have both? If you have both and you don't mind, I'd like us to look as if we're in church and use a Bible if you don't mind. In the meanwhile, turn these things off so that God is not disrespected because you cannot let one of these things ring in a courtroom. Are you with me? You may end up as a guest of the government behind bars. All right. The second favor I ask is that you pray for me while I speak. And all I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That request is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I only want to speak my words. You know, in, page, in Prophets and Kings, page 626, paragraph 1, Ellen White writes, The words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be spoken from the pulpit. Somebody say amen. amen. Which means I will withhold my opinions and I will only give you, thus saith the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. And the third favor I ask is that you, pray, you uh, think as you listen. Isaiah 1.18 says what? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Think as you listen. It's 20 minutes to 12. I'll release you by 12.30, if not before, but possibly 12.30. Let's bow our heads and pray to our God who loves us. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us, dear God. It's a stubborn love because you're unwilling to lose any of us. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord God, for the presence of your spirit that guides us, strengthens us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, if we have sinned against you in any way, forgive us, dear God. Grant us your grace. Give to us the mind of Christ that we may think like him, speak like him, and act like him. Now, Father, as I prepare to deliver this message, to your sons and your daughters, I ask you in the name of Jesus, take possession of my mind. I want to be Holy Spirit possessed. That my speech organs, my hearing apparatus, all that is required to deliver this message might be brought under your control and I surrender myself to you. I humble myself, God. Take all the glory. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory will I not give to another. Take the glory, dear God, but give us what we need. That is the blessing. Father, I ask you to pronounce a double blessing on all our guests. We're delighted to have them. Bless them lavishly, Father, generously, that they will always remember their time spent with us. 
Bless this country. Bless the leaders, God. Give them wisdom to make decisions that are advantageous to the gospel and a blessing to the people. Hear this humble prayer. Save us when you come, Father, without losing one. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen. What's our subject? Doing things God's way. 1 Kings chapter 17. Let's read from verse 1. Well, no, let's go to Matthew first. The Spirit just redirected me. Matthew 6. We'll read a verse that's very well known. Verse 33 of Matthew 6. Do you have that? I can still hear the pages of the Bible turning. Matthew 6, verse 33. You actually know it without looking. Say it with me. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This is the way we are supposed to live our lives. We are called by God to put him first. When? All the time. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Tell me for 6. In all thy ways, how many ways? All thy ways do what? Acknowledge him. What's the result? He shall direct thy paths. What are the paths? He shall direct you in romance so you don't make a catastrophic choice. As so many do. He will direct you in your finances so you don't end up burdened by debt. He will direct you in your family so that your family is strong. He will direct you in your educational pursuits. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Use your understanding, but don't lean on it. In all thy ways, without exception, do what? Acknowledge him. What's the outcome? He shall direct thy paths. God cannot lie. And every promise of God is made of tempered steel. It cannot be broken. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Let's identify all these things. Let's go to verse 25 of Matthew 6. Our subject, doing things God's way. Verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? That's a very serious lesson, and it's for another time. There's more to life than material possessions. Now I need a louder amen than that. There is more to life than having designer handbags. There's more to life than having designer shoes. I didn't say didn't get them. I said there's more to life than, they, than them. Are you with me? The Bible says, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, drink, or put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, verse 26 of Matthew 6. They sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feed of them. Finish that verse. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon... In all his glory, finish the verse, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Finish the verse. O oh, ye of little faith. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now read verse 32 for me. For after all these things, come on, do the Gentiles seek. Stop. What is it the Gentiles seek? Food, shelter, raiment. Now, should we seek these things? Yes. And the Bible will explain. After all these things, do the Gentiles seek. You see, these things are the priority of the Gentiles. 
Finish verse 32. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Now, verse 33, say it with me, but seek ye first. Stop. God doesn't say don't seek clothes. He does not say don't seek housing or don't seek food. He tells us they must not be our priority. Now that sounds harsh. How can food not be a priority? <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let me tell you a secret why people are not blessed. They don't follow God's system. And then they blame God. God tells us, put me first. And all these things shall be added without even asking. No amens for God. Amen. Do you have to ask your mother for food? No. Did you have to ask your father for clothes? No. For shoes to go to school? No. Where is your earthly parent more generous than God? No. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But let me elaborate on seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first not only the kingdom of God and God, but seek first the things of God. Put the church ahead of your house. This microphone is not working. I need a new one. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Let me say differently. Your house should not look nicer than God's church. Amen. Your house should not be finished and God's church look like a warehouse. When the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, when we seek God, everything that is of God becomes our priority. Amen. Let me show you what I mean from the Bible. 1 Kings 17, reading from verse 1. What book did I say? What chapter? From what verse? 1 Kings 17, reading from verse 1. It is a very familiar passage. Try to find these passages as quickly as possible so I can move on. It's already 10 to 12. Do you have 1 Kings 17? Not yet. Before I read it, let's pray again. Dear God, I don't want to speak long on the initial outlay of grace you gave me. Give me more grace now, more of your spirit, more clarity of mind, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And Elisha the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Ahab delivers a threat, not Ahab, Elijah, and then he just vanishes. He comes into the court, delivers God's word, then vanishes. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kerith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, for I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. God tells Elijah, go high. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the book Kerith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. A widow woman there to sustain thee. So he went, arose, and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. Now why was she doing that? And he called unto her and said, Bring me, I fetch me, I pray thee, a little drink in a vessel that I may, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Elijah's thirsty. He had been traveling a long distance. There's a drought and a famine in the land. He wants some water. 
And as she was going to fetch it, he called unto her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. What is a morsel? A little piece, not a loaf, a little piece. Elijah wants a little water and a little piece of bread. You see, the children of God sometimes suffer. One of the great mistakes of some preachers if to give, is to give people the idea that when you come to Christ, everything goes smoothly. When you come to Christ, the devil gets on your tail and he harasses you. There is an element of suffering when someone comes to God. As verily as there was an element of suffering in providing salvation, there is an element of suffering in following God. But that suffering is temporary because we have a reward that lasts how long? Forever. It is focusing on that reward that allows us to endure the present suffering. Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand that I may eat. And she said unto him, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not what? A cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and what? Die. This woman was in a life and death situation. Now, if there's one thing you and I will protect, it's our lives. We may not protect our clothes, our house, our car. We will protect our lives. So when the devil brought some strife or some disasters into the life of Job, took away his children, all his cattle, his sheep, his oxes, his ass, asses, and Job remained faithful, the devil went back to God and God said, he still remains faithful though you move him against me. And the devil said, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his life. The devil is saying, let me step up my attack. Let me touch his life. And the devil was right. Skin for skin, we will give everything to defend our lives. The woman told Abra uh, Elijah, behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go it and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. I say again, this was a life and death situation. And Elijah said unto her, fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. Now read the next part, the last part of that verse for me. But make me thereof, what's the next word? First. What? A little cake. What's the next step? Bring it unto me. Finish the verse. Then make for thee and for thy son. Now wait a minute. Someone will say about Elijah, this man has no feelings. This preacher is harsh. How can he ask poor people to give an offering? Doesn't he see how they dress? Doesn't he see that most of them walk? Can't he see? How can he ask them to make a sacrificial gift? Elijah looked at that half-starved woman. Lips dry and white with hunger. And he said to her, you make a cake for me first. Bring it, then go and make for yourself. Not make it, and set it aside, then make yours. No, bring it. Let me start eating, then go make yours. By the time you made yours, I'm finished with mine. <laughs> now, even though you see the word Elijah, Elijah represented someone. Who was that? God. What Elijah was saying, but make thereof a little cake first for God. Bring it to him. Then go take care of yourself. When you get paid, you must bring a little cake to God. Come on, talk to me. First, what's the name of that cake? The tithe. And what's the name of the gravy around that cake? <laughs> the offering. First. When I read that verse, or as I read it, I sometimes wonder what went through the head of that woman. A woman will do everything to defend the life of her children. Even attack her husband. But not in this church, but outside. Let me say it again. A woman defending her children is not someone to mess with. You see it in the animal world. 
You come too close to an animal that has little ones, your life is in danger. Yet she listened to the words of Elijah, risking her life and the life of her son because she trusted the man of God as a representative of God. And so she knew somehow that that little cake which caused her to be deprived was given to God. So she went and did according unto the saying of Elijah. Hmm? She made a cake and she brought it unto him. But Elijah said, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the crews of oil fail until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Verse 14, Elijah tells her, now that's before she goes to make the cake. God will bless your generosity. Now, Elijah is telling her that in a drought. The drought had been going on two or three years. The land was suffering, cattle dying, people dying. Ahab had to send men out throughout the country to find grass for the cattle. This is the condition. And Elijah tells her, rain will come. And she makes that cake for Elijah. The Bible says that she went and did according unto the words saying of Elijah. And she, read verse 15, and she, come on. And he, come on, and her house, finish the verse, did eat many days. Now, would she have eaten as much had she not responded to Elijah? No. Listen to me. You don't lose by giving to God. It's not that God needs a loaf of bread from you. The silver and the gold is his. The cattle upon a thousand hills. The crops are his. But God tests us. The Lord tries to remove selfishness from the heart because a selfish man cannot enter the kingdom of God, a kingdom based on the cross of Christ, for God so loved the world that he gave. God asks us to give to deliver us from the vice-like grip of selfishness. And she and he and her house did eat many days. Why? She put God, come on. What's our title? Doing things God's way. God first. God, let me tell you something. God must be ahead of your spouse. Any more amens? God must be ahead of your children. God must be ahead of your education. God must be ahead of your career. God must be ahead of whatever. God cannot occupy second place in the life and save you. Let me say it differently. The position from which God functions as Savior is position one. You remove God from that position and he cannot save you. So God does not desire to be one out of egotism. He desires to be one out of your interests. She and he and her house did eat many days. Let's go to Haggai chapter 1. What's our subject? Doing things God's way. Haggai chapter 1. A beautiful little book. Read it sometimes, several times. Haggai is two books before Malachi. Find Matthew, work your way back. Malachi, Zechariah, Halak, Haggai. Chapter 1, we read from verse 1. Do we have that? All right, can we read now? Let's read. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the what? First day of the month came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, unto Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Read for me now, This people say, Stop. Now let's apply the Bible to us. Can we do that? Yes. I need more yeses. Can we do that? Yes. This people say, Now put a name in this people. Mount Olives. Are you with me? You don't like me anymore. 
put Mount Olives in that verse. Read with me now. Mount Olives say, come on, read. The time is not come. The time that the Lord's house should be what? Mm -hmm. It's not time. I have tuition. I just had a child. I need something. It is not time to finish this. I have some projects of my own. So Mount Olive said, the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Read verse 4 for me. What does it say? Is it time, O ye, to what? To dwell where? In your sealed houses and this house lie waste. God is answering Mount Olives. Is it time, Mount Olives, for you to finish building your house, paying your tuition, buying your car, and this house is in this condition? Let me give you the historical background. Haggai prophesied around 520 and onwards. The Jews had been released from captivity when the Persians overthrew the Babylonians in 538 BC. They came back to Palestine, where they were from. The, the Jerusalem had been destroyed, the temple in ruins, the walls in ruins. They had begun to rebuild, and then they stopped. And they stopped for almost 20 years, they stopped, because they began working on their own houses. And God sends a message through Haggai, also Malachi, to warn them, listen, it, is, it will be disastrous for you if you continue to put your projects ahead of mine, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, high roofs, chandeliers, and there's nothing wrong with that, but don't put them ahead of God's house. And this house lie waste. Read verse 5 with me. Now, therefore, come on, thus saith the Lord of hosts, what? Consider your ways. Stop. God says, Listen, Mount Olives, what are you doing? What are you doing? Consider your ways. Verse 6. Read with me. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Come on. Ye eat, uh -huh, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye not filled with drink. Come on. Ye clothe you, but there's none warm. Now finish that verse carefully. And he that earneth wages earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. The money goes into your pocket and it's gone. Where's the money? I just had 50 million shillings. Where is it? There's a hole in your life. Not just your pocket. The problem is not your pocket. It's my life. It's my heart. It's my priorities. God's business is not first. And sometimes God has to show us who is boss. You have sown much and bring in little. You sowed 500 acres and you brought in half an acre of product. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled, always thirsty. You clothe you, but there is none warm. In other words, our efforts are useless. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. And I know, I know there's certain people who can testify to what I'm saying. Where does the money go at the end of the month? Where does it go? Verse 7, read with me. That said a lot of hosts, what? Consider your ways. Come on, wait. Go up to the mountain. Come on, bring wood and build a house and I will what? Take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Now God is telling them what to do, but he goes back to criticizing them. Verse 9, read with me. You looked for much, come on, and lo, it turned to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Now God is saying, look, all that you do is like a handful of dust. You bring it into your house, an eye, and it's gone. And that will be the case as long as my business is not your priority. Finish verse 9. God gives the reason. Why save the Lord of hosts? Finish verse 9. Because what? My house 
that lieth waste. Come on. And ye run every man unto his own house. Verse 10. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from a fruit. Come, read with me. And I call for the drought. Come on. Upon the land, read on. Upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, upon that which the ground bringeth forth, upon men, upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Whatever you do, I'll curse. Because my house is in ruins or it looks like it and yours is in good shape because my business is not taken care of and yours is, it need not be a house it can just be the work of God even if this becomes a palace we must put every aspect of God's work finish my finish my words first therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from a fruit now why is God threatening them that they might change their behavior. You see, punishment is strange behavior for God. Blessing is his natural behavior. God punishes us not because he's sadistic, but to turn our feet into the right path. My brothers and sisters, there is a divine principle by which you and I, I ought to live our lives, and that principle is God first. And this was the way Jesus Christ lived. Listen to his testimony in John 8, 29. Go there with me. Ten minutes after 12, we're in good time. John 8, 29, as we continue with the subject, doing things God's way. And God's way is God first. John 8, 29, listen to the testimony of Christ, who lived by this principle, God first. When you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me. And he that have sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Finish the verse. For I do always those things. Come on. That please him. How often? Always. Christ put the Father first. In his moment of greatest suffering. The greatest suffering of Christ was not so much on the cross as it was in the Garden of Gethsemane. On the cross, he didn't say, get me out of this. On the cross, his focus was other people. On the cross, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. On the cross, he told John, behold your mother. He told his mother, behold your son. On the cross, he saved the thief on the right. On the cross, his focus was other people in the garden. Three times he prayed, Father, if thou be willing, what? Remove this cup. That's where the suffering was intense. Even in the midst of his worst suffering, the mind of Christ rested with the Father and placed the Father first. Here's what he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. What's the next word? Nevertheless, finish it now, not my will, but thine be done. The Father first in suffering. That widow woman, God first in suffering at the risk of her life. I told you God must come ahead of your spouse. He must come ahead of your children. He must come ahead of your education, your career, your finances. Let me become extreme. God must take precedence ahead of our lives. And this is literal. When a soldier goes to war, the interests of his country take precedence over his life. You don't believe me. He is going to die for policies he may not even understand. We're in a war with the enemy. And one of the most powerful weapons we possess, which we seldom use, is unselfishness. It is a weapon against the devil. And God tells us, put me first. It is in that position that I can function as your general. I lead you into battle. I don't follow you. My brothers and sisters, my family at Mount Olives, the purpose of this message is not to make you sad or visibly depressed. It is to let you know there's a God who desires to bless you super abundantly like a shower of rain, but he does it under conditions. Are you with me? Is God willing to forgive? 
but he does it under condition. What is that? If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a condition. Is God will, willing to heal our sicknesses? Yes. Is there a condition? Yes. If thou will diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will keep his commandments, and give ear to all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. I am the Lord that healeth thee. There is a condition for healing. There is a condition for forgiveness. There is a condition for salvation. Amen. Recite with me the most popular verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here comes the condition that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. God has conditions. For everything except his love. God's love is unconditional. His blessings are not. God's love is unconditional. His salvation is not. There's a condition to live a blessed life. God must occupy position first. We must put the business of God ahead of our own business. And as you wrestle with that concept... Because it's not new, it's not uh, popular among those of us in the flesh. But as you wrestle with this concept, ask God to give you the courage to receive it. God first. In how many things? Everything. Here's the church, here's your house. Which should come first? The church. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Now, I'm not saying you're not doing what you can. I'm simply reminding you, keep doing it or do more. But not just the church. As I said, let me close the book as a visual symbol. I'm coming to the end. In every area, a young man sent me a text. This morning early, I was up about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. And I do a lot of online counseling. He said, Pastor, I found a young lady. I love her. I think I love her. I want to get with her. She's not in the church. <laughs> that's the wrong thing to tell me. <laughs> you know, you can, that's absolutely the wrong thing to bring to me. There's some things that just take me over the edge. And I wrote back, nice young fellow. He writes me all the time. And I said... The word of God I gave him. He wrote back and said, very interesting response. He said, I do this, I do that, I do that. A long list, I do that, I do that, I do this. He said, this carnal nature, I just can't deal with it. <laughs> it's too much for me. That's what he said. And I wrote back and said, Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. There is no such thing as I can't handle this carnal nature. Yes, you can handle it through Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But why did I go into that? Because you must, you must place God ahead of your romantic life. Amen. When you choose, you choose to please God. Listen to me again. I know you're listening with physically, but are you listening with your heart? You must think of God when making romantic choices. If you don't put God first in finances, okay. You don't put him first in education, okay. Put him first in romance. Because the worst suffering is not poverty. <laughs> the worst suffering is to be hooked up with the wrong man or the wrong woman. It is hell on earth. Are you with me? It is hell on earth and anywhere else you may escape to. And so I'm saying to you as your brother... What's our subject? This side. Doing things God's way means doing what? Are they right? Are they right? Are they right? How many will say with me, Father, help me to humble myself and to think of you first in everything I do. Can I see your right hand? Now don't play with God. Mean it. Stand up with me. Everything I do.
Let me tell you a secret. It's not a secret, but I'll tell you anyway. You can do things differently other than God's way and still see what looks like results. Because the devil can give you things. Revelation 13 verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his heads ten crowns and upon his, upon his crowns, his horns, ten crowns and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him what? His power, come on, and his seat, come on, and great authority. Who gave them to him? The devil. The devil promised to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if you would worship him. The devil can give you things. But what the devil gives you may benefit you only in this life. But there's something called the life to come. Now here's what the Bible says. Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness, that's putting God first, is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of the life that is to come. When we put God's first, God first, the benefits we accrue from God, they bless us now and the blessings continue into the life to come. Amen. Now you all intelligent people, this life is only this long. The life to come is endless. Where should your focus be on this? Put God first. Put his house ahead of your house. You will have a testimony of God's goodness in your life. Put God ahead of your romance. Put God at the head of your educational plans. Put God at the head of your family planning. You will have a testimony of how God rewards those who honor him. 1 Samuel 2 verse 30, God says, I will honor those who honor me. It works. It works. Is there someone right now making plans for life? You're making plans for life. You did not consciously put God at the head. But you want to do that now, having heard his word. Let me say it again. Is this someone you are actively making plans, education, job, profession, career, whatever, but you did not consciously put God at the head. Now, having heard his word, you want to put God first. Is there someone like that? Can I see your right hand? You are actively making some kind of plan, but you did not consider God first. You want to do that now, and God is watching you. He's not spying. He's watching. Two different things. Keep your hand up. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you today, God, first forgive me if I have spoken badly. If I misrepresented the truth by contaminating it with my opinions, forgive me, Father. Now I ask in the name of Jesus, who himself is the word, that you would clarify what I have said and apply it with force and conviction to every listening mind. Father in heaven, convince us, dear God, convict us of this truth. A life led by God, a life where God is first, is the blessed life to live. Father, register and record every upraised hand. That hand says, I am making plans, but have not consciously put God at the head. Now, having heard his word, I place God first. Let him direct me in all these areas where I am presently making plans. Father, this is your church. It's under construction. We read from your word that you withheld the dew, you withheld the rain, you withheld the fruit, you withheld the cattle, you withheld blessings. Why? Because your people's houses were placed ahead of your house. Now, dear God, help us to do the intelligent thing and place this house ahead of our houses. Place your work ahead of our work. Place your business ahead of ours. Father, forgive us. For not having done this. We know you'll forgive because you delight in mercy. Now look upon all of us, dear God. Hands raised or not, look at all of us. Bless us. Let us leave this place with this message. God first. God first. And let us see how he blesses our lives. Bless every man, woman, boy, and girl. A double blessing on all our visitors, dear God. Thank you for your love. 
Thank you that we can establish this church as a witness in this part of this country. And let this church, dear God, be the reason many people are ready to meet Christ when he comes. Bless every member, bless every house, bless every child. Save us when you come. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let God's people say, Amen, amen. and Amen. 286, unless the choir... 286? It's okay. 286, our closing hymn. Please stay standing. And they are indeed words of life, so sing with all your heart and soul. 286. Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Let God's people say amen, amen. and amen.